Dear saints in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You don't need me to tell you this, but the world we live in is constantly changing. Technology changes faster than I'm able to keep up with it, I confess. Language changes. My kids say things that I don't really even understand what that means anymore. You know, the words don't mean the same things as they used to mean, I don't think. And the way that people think about things, you know, moral, social, ethical kinds of things, that changes too. Everything, it seems, changes. And one of the changes that I think we can see going on in the world around us right now is that people are becoming more and more aware of sin. Now, I put sin in quotation marks because the way that people in the world think about sin isn't necessarily quite the same way that we as Christians would think about sin, nor is it the same way that the Bible talks about sin. And, and sin isn't necessarily the word that the people out there in the world would use to describe the thing it is that they're becoming more and more aware of. But in a general kind of way, we can say, I think, that the world out there and the people in the world are becoming more and more aware of sin, more and more aware of the reality that everything in the world isn't the way that it is supposed to be, and that there is evil out there that needs to be dealt with. And this, this increasing awareness of sin is demonstrated, I think, in what some people call um, our call-out culture nowadays. There's more and more focus these days on calling out various evils and injustices, a.k.a. sins, that we see around us, whether it's racism or the abuse of power and authority or even something as simple as people refusing to comply with whatever COVID-19 guidelines the government is giving. People are eager, it seems, to call out the wrongs that they see and they do this in a whole host of different ways, either uh, by posting something on social media, Facebook or something like that, or by personally, personally confronting those whom they think need to be called out, or perhaps, as we've seen all across our continent, really, over the last few months, protests or joining in protests of some kind or another. Now, in some ways, I think that we as Christians can and should recognize this, what's going on in our culture around us, to a certain degree anyways, as a good thing. Because as Christians, we recognize that the world most certainly isn't the way that it should be, hasn't been since the fall into sin in Genesis chapter 3. And we know that there is evil out there that needs to be dealt with. We also know that the way to deal with evil isn't by sweeping it under the rug and pretending it doesn't exist but instead to address it directly the way that God does in his law. So there's a sense in which we can see what's going on in the world around us as a good thing. That being said, however, there's one thing, one very, very important thing, one thing that we as Christians recognize is of absolute fundamental importance that our culture that's so focused on calling out evil is missing. One very important thing, forgiveness. I don't know if you've noticed, but there is very little forgiveness in the world these days. People are quick to hold one another accountable for their sins, quick to condemn those who have viewpoints that are different than their own, quick to tear down statues of people who made, who made, did evil things in the past, and quick to condemn one another. But they are not nearly so quick to forgive. And that's why it's so important that we take the message of our gospel reading this morning seriously. In our gospel reading this morning, Jesus tells us the parable of the unforgiving servant. The basic gist of the parable is that a man, a servant, who owes an enormous debt, it's hard for us to kind of 
get the, the idea of it because we don't deal in talents anymore, but it says that he, he owes his master 10,000 talents, which one commentator I read this week suggested that in modern currency would be about the equivalent of three billion dollars. And yes, you heard that right, billion, not million, billion. Three billion dollars. A servant who owes his master three billion dollars, don't ask me how he ran up a three billion dollar tab, I have no idea. Owes his master three billion dollars, is called in before his master to repay his debt. When this servant begs for patience, however, and insists that if he's given more time, he will come up with the money and repay the debt, the master does something unthinkable. He forgives the entire debt. All three billion of it down to the very last penny. But when that servant went out from his master's presence, he went and he found another servant who owed him what uh, Jesus says, a, a hundred denarii, which in modern currency, that's probably about $6,000. Like not chump change here. Six grand is nothing to bat an eye at, but still, it's not much compared to three billion. And rather than forgiving as he had first been forgiven, this servant grabs his fellow servant by the throat, chokes him and demands payment immediately. When that servant begs for, for patience and insists that he'll come up with the money, the, the servant has no mercy and locks him away in prison until the debt is paid. Word about this, of course, gets back to the master and he's understandably furious. He revokes the forgiveness of that $3 billion, locks up this servant in the jail, until every cent is paid, which of course is never going to happen because you ain't going to come up with $3 billion in jail. Now for us today, I think this parable serves as a, a challenge. It challenges us to think about how we, having been forgiven our debts, go out of our master's presence, how we go out from here, from the church, into the world. It challenges us to recognize the opportunity that we have to bring forgiveness to this fallen world. Like the servant in the parable, when we come here to church, we stand here in the presence of our master as a servant who owes that master a great enormous debt. And yet, he, our master, graciously and mercifully forgives all of our sins, all of our debts, each and every one down to the last penny without any merit or worthiness in us. We've heard this a few times or two times already in our service today. We start the service with the invocation. We come into the presence of our God and we hear those words in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and we're reminded that we were initially brought into the presence of this master, of this God, through holy baptism, and there in that water he washed away all of our sins. And after that we heard the words of absolution, when after we had confessed our sins, acknowledged our debt to God, God spoke to us and declared that all of our sins, each and every one of them, down to the last penny, were absolutely and completely forgiven. And in case it hasn't sunk in yet, we're going to get a reminder again too when we receive the very body and blood of our master to assure us that this forgiveness of sins is real and is for each and every one of us. Having been so forgiven then, we have the opportunity to go out into this world where forgiveness isn't really a thing and bring the forgiveness that we have received here to the hearts of all these people who are so desperately in need of it. It's the opportunity that we have. Now this week, I came across a, a, a news story that I think helps us to see the extent of the opportunity 
that we have here. And it speaks, I think, rather well to the, the circumstances in the world as we see them around us today. On October 2nd, 2019, a young man named Brant Jean took his place in the witness stand of a Dallas, Texas courtroom in order to deliver his victim impact statement. Amber Geiger, a former Dallas police officer, had just been convicted and sentenced to 10 years in prison for the murder of Brant's brother. She had mistakenly, apparently, entered Brant's brother's apartment, thinking that it was her own apartment, and thinking him to be an intruder in her apartment, she shot him and killed him. And so Brant took his place in the witness stand that day in the courtroom in Dallas, Texas, having just heard that this woman who killed his brother would be in prison for 10 years. And he looked at her, at Amber, and he said to her, I forgive you. And he said that he only wanted the best for her. And he said that he hoped that as a result of all of this, and he said this is what his brother would have wanted, that she would give her life to Christ. And then, after asking permission to do so from the judge and to the astonishment of everyone there in the courtroom, he got up from the witness stand and walked over to this woman who had murdered his brother and gave her a hug. And she sobbed into his shoulder. Our opportunities to forgive other people might not be quite so dramatic, quite so newsworthy, but they're just as real. And they're just as significant. And they're just as needed. We have the opportunity to bring the forgiveness that we have received here to the world. So the question we have to wrestle with, though, is how? How in the world does a man forgive someone like that for such a, a, a terrible crime, the murder of his brother? How do we forgive those who sin against us? Now, I don't want to put words into this young man's mouth and tell you this is why he forgave her, right? I couldn't, not like I could get him to come here and speak for himself, though, so I gotta, I gotta try, right? And I'd suggest that the only way that this kind of forgiveness is possible is when we take seriously, believe in, and rejoice in the extent to which God has first forgiven us. The problem we have, the problem that makes it so difficult for us to forgive other people, because it is really difficult, it's a challenge for all of us, the problem we have that, that keeps us from forgiving others is that we have this tendency to think that, that our sins, the sins that we commit, are somehow small and trifling compared to those that have been committed against us. The problem with that is when we think this way, we also think small of the forgiveness that God has given to us through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And this is all played out here in this parable here this morning. If you go back to the parable, the guy who owes his master $3 billion, when he gets called to account here and told that he needs to pay up, he looks at the master and says, have patience with me, give me more time, I'll come up with the money. Now think about that for a second. How in the world is he ever going to come up with three billion dollars if he works day and night for the rest of his life he ain't getting three billion not unless he really gets a really great promotion or something like that if he goes out and buys a lottery ticket 
and wins the $100 million prize, it's still just a drop in the bucket of $3 billion. And yet this guy stands there in the presence of his master to whom he owes $3 billion and says, just give me more time, I'll pay it back. What's going on here, I think, is that this servant has no idea how much he owes his master. He doesn't even get it. And so that's why when he has been forgiven, he goes out and he does not forgive because he doesn't understand the, 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 the extent of the mercy that has been shown to him. It's like, like, like Jesus said in another place. He said, the one who has been forgiven little loves little. Now, the man had been forgiven a lot. But in his mind, he had been forgiven a little. And so he loved little. And so how do we become more forgiving? How do we forgive those who sin against us? How does a person forgive the murderer of his brother? By taking seriously, believing, and yes, rejoicing in the extent to which we have first been forgiven. In my own... um, devotions lately. I've been reading through uh, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, and I'm still only in chapter 5. But as I've been uh, reading all these words and reflecting on them, it's helped me to think more personally and more deeply about how much God has forgiven me. Listen to what, what Jesus says here in the Sermon on the Mount as he speaks about the fifth commandment of the Ten Commandments, the commandment that says, you shall not murder. This is what Jesus says. He says, you have heard it said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Now that last little bit always sticks me. Because I've said things a lot worse to people than you fool. And I've especially thought things about other people that are far worse than that. And each and every time, Jesus says, we think those things, or we say those things, we're liable to the hell of fire. And that's just one commandment. You know, we like to think that we've kept the fifth commandment, right? We pat ourselves on the back, I didn't kill anybody today. But Jesus says, no, we haven't even begun to keep that commandment. And we can times that by 10 if we want to get the rest of the 10 commandments. Or better yet, we can times it by 613, because that's the number of commandments that are apparently in the Old Testament, according to some people. And we'll start to recognize the depth of our own debt. $3 $3 billion could be put in it lightly. But what does God, our master, to whom we owe this enormous debt on account of our sin, what does he say to you and to me? I forgive you all your sins. Not because of who you are and what you've done, but because of my great love for you, my compassion for you, And my son who bled and died, that in him you might have forgiveness and eternal life. When we take that seriously, when we believe in that and rejoice in that, God will work through that, through that good news, through that gospel, to soften our hard hearts that are so slow to forgive and enable us to forgive those who sin against us. We have a glorious opportunity in the world today to be the light of the world, to be the salt of the earth, to be God's people that the world needs us to be, and to carry the forgiveness that we have here, out there, into a world that knows what sin is and is starting to understand sin better, but doesn't even begin to understand the extent of God's love the extent of God's mercy, or this thing called forgiveness.
So may God strengthen us to forgive like this, to forgive like Brandt did, to forgive as we have been forgiven. For Jesus' sake, amen.